just in cases. All right, you guys. So um, we're starting chapter four. And chapter four is on probability. Okay, so at the beginning of the semester, we talked a little bit about probability and statistics in real life. And just to kind of revisit this, because probability is really one of those topics that is so powerful, because it's really all around us. It affects our everyday thinking. Um, for at least, I would say, the last 20 odd years, probability and statistics topics have been interwoven into the K through 12 curriculum. Whereas back when I was in school, um, elementary, junior high, high school, or at least I was supposed to be in school, um, that was not the case. So I truly saw absolutely no probability or statistics topics until I was in college. And since I was a STEM major, I had a probability, uh, a calculus-based probability class. <laughs> so, you know, jumped right in with two feet. Uh, whereas, you know, again, now it even starts in kindergarten. So anyways, um, these are the six sections that we're covering in the text. Um, it's, I believe, our largest chapter. It has the most homework problems. And so fortunately, we do cover this over three classes today and then Tuesday, Thursday next week. So we often think about probability as like the classic example with the weather, right? What is the probability it's going to rain tomorrow? And so there are computer models now that make predictions based on prior conditions and, you know, formulas and models that are created. So basically, you know, when these certain conditions are present, this kind of barometric pressure, this temperature, this humidity level, et cetera, et cetera, did it rain or not? And then based on that, we can predict, you know, in the past, it has rained, say, 37% of the time. And so this Saturday, there is a 37% chance of rain where I live. Um, in medicine and healthcare, we use these ideas to analyze and to make predictions of like recovery times after surgery, right? Anyone who's going in for a surgery, they might ask the doctor, how long might I expect to be out of work or can't I drive or do I need to be on bed rest or whatever? Um, the efficacy of medicine or vaccinations, right? Makes predictions based on, um, you know, prior studies of how effective a vaccine is going to be to prevent hospitalization or death. Um, we can analyze the spread of disease like COVID um, for voting and elections. We're going into an election year. We just had another debate yesterday, right? And a lot of our homework problems have looked at sampling voters and making predictions about who might win an election or who or what proposition might pass, right, in a city. Um, in insurance, we can calculate risk and assign premiums based on those risks, right? Someone driving like a brand new Mustang living in this area, you know, what's the likelihood or the probability that they might uh, get a speeding ticket or get in a car accident, those types of things. And in financial markets, stocks, trades, investments, um, we've seen some quality control, like what is, um, I don't know, like the the lifespan of batteries. Um, also, we can look at, you know, what's the likelihood that like a bottle is going to have more than 12 fluid ounces in it. This is supposed to have 12 fluid ounces, but it's never going to be perfect. So um, in research, all different areas of research, you know, in education, what is the probability that a student is going to earn their degree or pass a class 
and maybe we're doing a study where there's some new sort of, you know, treatment curriculum program. And then in just our everyday lives, right, we use this type of thinking. And this is what I love about math and statistics, you know, the more we really learn something in a personal way and we own it, we're able to truly make use of it in our daily lives. What is the probability that the freeway is going to be crowded at 9 a.m. tomorrow, right? And our brains start looking back at patterns like nine out of 10 times in the past, it's been crazy at 9 a.m. So there's a 90% chance it's going to be like that tomorrow. Um, okay. So probability and how useful it is. 4.1 is on terminology. You know, let me also say, I believe this chapter, so it's not only the longest with the most homework problems, I feel like it's the least aligned with Alex. And so, I mean, I have kind of copied this from someone else. Uh, and, you know, I could see they really tried to match the book. Uh, okay, yeah. And, uh, but yeah, so I just want to point that out. So um, I have tried to, in the lecture notes, make sure I've included stuff from the textbook, but then I really want to make sure that you guys are able to do your homework, which is going to feed into the practice exams and your exams. And then you could always come back to the lecture notes to reinforce if you want to see a definition or something like that. And then I got a private uh, message about you know, the pricing for Alex. And thanks for bringing that up. Um, I know that our free access is supposed to expire in two days. And I have been emailing these people all week and I'm currently waiting for a response. Um, I'm, I'm pretty confident <laughs> that if they are not able to get the pricing right, by the 30th, again, it should be $39.99. I'm pretty confident they're just going to have to extend that financial aid access date again. Okay, so I'll be uh, posting an announcement, which will be automatically emailed to everybody with an update as soon as I hear. And yeah, no one's going to lose their accounts with all their their grades. I'll throw a fit. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Okay. Honestly, that's never, ever happened before. And, you know, my, my stance is always, I, I have said this since I started teaching over 25 years ago, I will never, ever, ever let some outside external force affect your grade. If Grades were lost. I would just have to give everybody an A. Like I would never let it negatively affect you, you know? Um, so please don't worry about that. Okay. And um, <laughs> you're welcome. A blast in a glass. <laughs> That's so funny. You're welcome. But truly, you know, it's just, it's not fair. And I have had, um, you know, in over 25 years, you see a lot. And I have experienced many kinds of catastrophes and, you know, problems, you know, like natural disasters, um, classes on 9-11 that I had to cancel, you know, teaching in a computer room where everything is broken. I mean, just all kinds of craziness. And I've never let it affect anybody. So, um Hopefully I'll have an answer on that soon though, to share with everybody. So for now, you guys are all good. All right, so I've got some basic terminology here and even just these everyday words that we hear about, you know, likely, most likely, highly likely, least likely, right? Because probability can be defined as the likelihood an event will happen, right? How likely is it? It could be impossible. There is a zero probability. 
It could be certain there's a 100% chance, right? Absolute certainty, etc. cetera. Um, it can also be defined as the fraction of times an event will occur when some process is repeated a large number of times. So again, thinking about like those weather models, you know, looking back over just thousands and thousands of days with certain conditions, right? So uh, that's a large number of times, the fraction of times that it rained, right? When those conditions were present. So that would give us a probability. Uh, we define a sample space as the set of all possible outcomes for an experiment, which is a chance process undertaken a large number of times together with the results. So I know we oftentimes think of an experiment as like in a chemistry lab or something, but it really could be anything. Like, hey, I, I'm teaching with a new textbook. I want to compare how one class did on the exam with my other class, right? This is an experiment. Um, a trial is each observation of an experiment. So oftentimes, again, we're doing something a large number of times. We're rolling dice, you know, thousands of times. Um, lottery balls are being chosen large numbers of times. And I meant to buy lottery tickets today because the the jackpot or whatever is up pretty high again. I forgot. Um, so a trial is each observation of an experiment, and then an outcome is each result of a trial of an experiment. And again, we can always refer back to this. I'm going to keep kind of coming at all of this stuff from different angles. We're going to be looking at lots of different problems. Um, an event is a set of one or more outcomes. Theoretical probability is a probability arrived at by knowledge based on a theory, like tossing a fair coin. So for example, right, if you toss a fair coin, um, that's your experiment is you're going to toss it like a thousand times or something. Um, the sample space we write out using set brackets and each possible outcome would be getting a hail, a heads <laughs> or getting a tails. Okay. If you're looking at, say, you know, we're going to be trying to find out the probability of getting a heads, then, you know, flipping heads is an event. Okay, and then if we look down here, the definition of probability, the probability of some event happening, it's the number of outcomes in E. So if we say we're looking at what's the probability of flipping the heads as our event, the number of outcomes in E, there's only one outcome there. And then the number in the sample space is two. And so the probability of flipping heads is a half. Now you guys might be thinking, I already knew it was a half. Why are you bogging me down with all of this terminology and notation and everything? And, you know, we're starting out very small, just talking about flipping a coin, uh, something that we're all very familiar with. But as we move along, these are going to get more and more complex. And so we're really going to be depending on all of the terminology and notation. Okay. So you are going to want to actually link together the notation, the terminology with your understanding of what's going on. So you can use this 
and understand how questions are written and whatnot, okay? I know that there's a lot of new kind of vocabulary. That's why there's this whole section in the book on terminology for probability. Okay, and again, this is a theoretical probability of flipping a coin. It's a fair coin. So the idea with the fair coin is that the probability of getting a heads is a half, probability of getting a tails is a half. And, you know, one half, that's the same as 0.5 or 50%. Okay, with a fair coin, it's 50-50, 50% chance of getting heads, 50% chance of getting tails. But again, in practice, there's literally no such thing as a fair coin, where it's literally exactly 50%. If there were, we would not be able to prove that, right? Because our machines have some kind of error in them. And if we were trying to somehow measure it, our measuring device is also man-made. It's gonna have some inherent error in it, okay? They, this kind of error problem has been plaguing human, human beings throughout history. I mean, I, I think about the Greeks trying to prove some of the geometry stuff and they thought if they made like really huge triangles, they could try to prove like precise things and you just can't, okay? Everything in math is pretty much an idealization. There is no perfect circle. There is no perfect rectangle. There is no perfect triangle. There is no perfect coin, okay? So we also have this notion of an experimental probability. And this is found by comparing how many times an event occurs to the total number of trials. So for example, suppose you flip a coin a thousand times. What is the probability of getting heads. Well, suppose it lands on heads like 563 times out of a thousand. Right, so it's close to 50%. It's a little bit more. And you know, the, the larger the number of times, the closer this ought to be to the theoretical probability. If it's a pretty reasonable coin, you know? Okay. And so again, in real life, we know that things aren't exact. So depending on what we're doing, we would more likely go with an experimental probability because in practice, that's what we're using, you know? And it's good to compare it to a th theoretical probability. Okay, so again, I'm trying to, you know, impart some big picture understanding and whatnot. So the probability of an event happening is some number between zero and one. Okay, a zero probability means something is impossible. Like you have a fair coin. What's the probability it lands on a jack? It's zero because you only have heads or tails, not a jack. I just made that up. Um. Right, what's the probability that if I reach in my wallet, I'm gonna pull out, you know, I have so many bills. I have singles, I have fives, I have twenties. What's the probability I'm gonna pull out some Japanese yen 
zero. I don't have any Japanese yen in my wallet, right? It's, so it's impossible. Um, one is absolute certainty. That's a hundred percent. Okay. It's like one whole pie. This is zero percent. And then probability is any number between there. Like we had 50 percent. Right. So you could think in terms of fractions, decimals, or uh, percentages. Right, again, just as an example, there is a 37% chance of rain this weekend where I live. That 0 0.37 or 37 hundredths. These are all numbers between zero and one. You could think of like the change between zero and a dollar, right? Okay. All right, so for theoretical probability, just some quick examples. If you toss one die, possible outcomes are one, two, three, four, five, six. Each is equally likely. So the theoretical probability of rolling a two is one out of the six possible outcomes. If the coin is tossed, the theoretical probability of obtaining a head is one half. With this spinner, the theoretical probability of getting a three, and you know, it's like a flat piece of paper with that arrow that spins, you could flick it, and then the arrow lands somewhere. And so notice, it really goes by the angle. Right, that's a quarter of the way around. You could also look at the area, but it really is the angle that determines the probability. And the probability of the pointer landing on two is a half, because that angle is half the way around, right? It's 180 out of the 360. All right, so let's just start looking at some of the homework. It never, okay. Okay, good. Usually time's out and then I have to log back in. And so just to show you 55 homework problems. I know that's a lot, but again, we have three class periods. So we'll do like roughly 20 or so per uh, per class. Ah, it did time out after all. Okay, a bag has six balls labeled A, B, C, D, E, and F. One ball will be randomly picked and its letter will be recorded as the outcome. Give the sample space describing all the possible outcomes. And then uh, give the event of choosing a letter from D to F. And so notice Alex already gives you the set brackets because we list elements of a set in set brackets. And so the sample space just contains those elements separated by a comma. And then the event of D through F is D, E, F. Okay, pretty straightforward. Let's see if there's something different. 
A number cube with faces labeled one to six will be rolled once. Give the sample space describing all possible outcomes. So you're just going to list all those numbers from one to six. Then give all the outcomes for the event of rolling an even number. So it's a subset of the sample space. Those are all the even numbers, two, four, and six. Okay. All right, a bag with six marbles is shown. The six marbles are blue. A marble is drawn at random from the bag. What is the probability that it's blue? <laughs> There's no other choice, they're all blue, so the probability is one, right? Let's see a difference. Okay, now here a bag with 10 marbles is shown, three are yellow, two are blue, and five are red. A marble is chosen from the bag at random. What is the probability that the marble is not yellow. So if it's not yellow, then it's either blue or red. So that is seven out of the 10. You guys see that? And it says to enter a fraction or a whole number. So in other words, not a decimal. They want the fraction, okay? Okay, there are four red marbles, three yellow and one blue with eight marbles in this bag. A marble is chosen. What's the probability that it's red? So you've got a four out of eight chance of drawing a red marble, which simplifies to a half, but it's fine to leave it unsimplified. Sometimes, especially if we're comparing it's nice to compare when they all have the same denominator. All right, a box contains 10 cards. And so the sample space it's all those letters. I recommend you do write things down instead of trying to do them mentally. And then what's the probability of choosing a letter from L to Q? So there are 10 in the sample space, and there are one, two, three, four, five, six in the event. So six tenths. All right. A box is filled with four red, eight blue, and two yellow. A crayon is chosen at random. Find the probability that it's a red or a yellow crayon. 
So altogether, you have 14 crayons. Right, that's the total number. And number of crayons that are red or yellow, there are four plus two or six. Right. So you've got six fourteenths. You could simplify it, but again, it's customary to leave the denominator. Okay. All right, Selma's going to watch a movie in her collection. She has three action movies, 11 comedies, and nine dramas. She will randomly select one movie. What's the probability that the movie she selects is not a comedy? Okay, so altogether, she has 23, uh, 23 movies. That's the number in the sample space. Movies that are not a comedy, you have nine plus three. Okay. All right, and then we've got problems involving a standard deck of cards. So in a standard deck, there are 52 cards. There are four suits. Two of them are red, hearts and diamonds. Two are black, spades and clubs. Notice the ace is often counted as a one, two, three, four, all the way up to 10. And then this would be 11, 12, 13 cards in each suit. And then 13 times four is 52. These cards with a jack, queen, and king or king on them are called face cards because they literally have a face on the card. So what's the probability if one card is drawn at random that, that the card drawn is a 10? There are four ways to draw a 10 out of the 52 cards. And then what's the probability that a card drawn is a red card. So I've got 13 and 13, that's 26 out of 52, which by the way is a half, right? Half the cards are red. So now suppose I told you, hey, draw a card, if your card is a 10 or a red card, you're going to win. What's the probability you're going to win? What do you guys think? Right, we count all the possible ways you could win. Right, we've got 26 in those two rows. And then here we've got two more. Now see, I know it's tempting though to say four plus 26 is 30. But if you did that, you would be counting the 10 of hearts and the 10 of diamonds twice, right? Because those two cards are in, you know, both the red cards and the tens. And so you can't count all of those, you know, twice. Okay. 
Okay. And this is actually a principle. The addition rule, the probability of A or B, it's the probability of one plus the probability of another minus the probability that they're both true, right, at the same time. So the probability that they're both 10 and red, right? You subtract one of them because you've counted them twice, okay? So you could use that, you know, that formula. You could say it's four out of 52 plus 26 out of 52 minus two out of 52. And when you're adding and subtracting fractions and they all have the same denominator, you can just add and subtract straight across. So you get 30 minus two is 28 over 52. Right. And again, you might think, well, why do I need to do this if I can just count them? Because sometimes you're not gonna wanna write everything out Sometimes it might be impossible to write everything out or impractical. So eventually we're going to be making use of this um, probability rule for addition. Okay, so what about this one, you guys? What's the probability that a card drawn is a heart? Right. Either way, we could say a fourth because a fourth of them are hearts, or you could say 13 out of 52. And then what's the probability that the card drawn is a face card? Right, we've got three, six, nine, twelve out of the fifty two. What's the probability that the card drawn is a heart and a face card? Right. If they're if they have to be both, there's only three cards out of the 52. Okay, and so see what I'm saying? Sometimes it's just nice to kind of compare all with the same denominator. Just then. But Alex will accept simplified fractions too. But don't, uh, you know, approximate with decimals unless they round exactly. By the way, so we learned this early on, but we probably forget if we don't use, right? Some fractions can be expressed precisely with a decimal. Right. These are all exact. But where you get in trouble 
<laughs> is what about a third? Let's see what a seventh is. Approximately. Okay, these are not exact numbers. They're just approximations. They don't have an exact decimal equivalent. The only fractions that have an exact decimal equivalent are ones where the denominator only has factors of uh, twos and fives. So the bottom must have, must factor into twos and fives only. And why? Because two times five gives you 10. And these are, these place values are powers of tens, right? Tenths, hundredths, thousandths. So two is two to the one, 10 is two times two, four is two squared, okay? You can only have factors of twos and fives in the bottom for a terminating decimal representation. These are called rational numbers. Uh, these are rational also, but they do not have um, a terminating decimal representation, okay? So anyways, Alex is gonna tell you to write as a fraction or round to three decimal places or something like that. Okay, there's also this notion of a complement. Um, an event and its complement add up to 100%. So for example, the event, it's going to rain Saturday, is the complement of it will not rain Saturday. So 37% chance it's going to rain, 63% chance it will not rain. There are no other options. Either it'll rain or it won't. They're called complements of each other, and they add up to one or 100%. So like here, you have 10 cards. They're either gray or they're white. So the probability of choosing a gray card plus the probability of choosing a white card is 100%. Um, a card is drawn at random. Let X be the event that the card drawn is gray. So P of X is the probability that the card drawn is gray. And then let, notice it says not X, right? Be the event that the drawn card is not gray. So again, it's either gray or it's not gray. They're complements of each other. So for each event in the table, check the outcomes that are contained in the event and then um, enter the probability. So for the event that the card drawn is gray, and it's helpful that they've grayed out the outcomes here for you too, you would just select which ones are gray. And so you've got three, four, five, six, seven out of the 10 are gray. And then not gray, is four, seven, and 10. Those are three tenths. Notice seven tenths plus three tenths equals one. Okay. 
1 minus p of not x. So p of not x, the probability not x, is 3 tenths. 1 can be written as 10 tenths. So 10 tenths minus 3 tenths is 7 tenths. Select the answer that makes the sentence true. So 1 minus p of not x is the same as, look, 1 of 1 minus p of not x equals 7 tenths. Look at what else equals 7 tenths. It's the same as p of x. And again, that's because p of x plus p of not x equals 1. I can subtract this from both sides. And so P of X is the same as one minus P of not X. Right, in other words, either one of these, it's one minus the other because added together, they make up one whole. Right, so I, I almost picture, you know, like literally there are two pieces. And the two together make up one whole. So if you have a whole and you take away this piece, right, you're left with the other piece. If you have a whole, and you take away this piece, you're left with the other piece. Because together, they add up to one, okay? I try to explain it all kinds of different ways. It's good to have multiple understandings, you know, a graph with numbers, with algebraic symbols. It all reinforces our understanding. Let's see if there's something else. All right, here's a bag of marbles or balls. Okay, 10 balls numbered from one to 10. Three is gray, the rest are white. A ball is selected at random. Let X be the, the event that the selected ball is white. So P of X is the probability that the selected ball is white. Right, so that's nine tenths. Not X is the one gray. And there's one out of 10. One is 10 tenths minus nine tenths gives you one tenth. And that's the same as P of not X, okay? Right. P of X is nine tenths. So 10 of them minus nine of them gives you one of them. and it equals P of not X, okay? All 
All right, Kiko works as an IT tech for our local companies. There are 100 computers on the network and 86 of them are not infected with a virus. Uh, she chooses a computer on the company's network at random. Let A and B be events as possible. The computer she chooses is not infected with the virus. So not infected, there are 86 out of the 100. So how many are infected with the virus? Fourteen out of the hundred, right? Because either it's infected or it's not. And we can write these as decimals, do not round. So these are exact. 86% and that's 14%. Okay. It's because on the bottom we have 100. It's made up of twos and fives. Two times five times two times five. All right, let's see if there's another situation. All right, in a certain online computer game, there are 100 players, 46 are not on the green team. The game randomly chooses a player to receive a bonus. Let A and B be as follows. Find the probability. So what's the probability of A? And what's the probability of B? As decimals. Right, A is not on the green team. So 46 out of 100 are not. And that means 54 out of the 100 are. Okay. All right. LaShonda rolled a number cube 200 times and got the following results. Round your answers to the nearest thousands. Okay, so she rolled the number one 45 times, the number two 24 times, et cetera, et cetera. So what's the experimental probability of rolling a two? It's going to be 24 out of the 200 which is 0.12, okay. Now, theoretically, each one of those numbers, one, two, three, four, five, and six are equally likely. So there's a one out of six chance of rolling a two, which is approximately now, this is rounded to 0.167. round to the nearest thousands. Okay, so the larger the number of rolls, the greater the likelihood that the experimental probability will be close to the theoretical probability. Mm 
All right, so here's a spinner with 10 equally sized slices, four yellow, three red, three blue. Maria spun the dial 50 times and got these results. So compute the experimental probability of landing on red or yellow. So that's going to be the sum of these two out of 50, right? 32 out of 50. You could multiply the top and bottom by two to get it out of 100. So it'll be 64 hundredths. It's the nearest thousandths. Assuming that the spinner is fair, what is the theoretical probability of landing on red or yellow? So there are four yellow and three red out of 10, and they're all equally sliced, sized. So that's seven out of 10. Okay, with a small number of spins like 50, it's not surprising that the experimental probability is um, not equal or close to the theoretical. Or in this case, it's much less. All right. Trying to squeeze it all in. There's no winning. All right. All right, so uh, let's take a break here. We'll come back and we'll do number 10. Everybody. Okay. A number cube is rolled three times. An outcome is represented by a string of the sort OEE, -E, meaning an odd number on the first roll, an even number on the second roll, and an even number on the third roll. The mm -hmm. eight outcomes are listed in the table below. Note that each outcome has the same probability. Okay, so one trial is rolling the cube three times. So here, one outcome is getting odd, odd, odd. One outcome is getting odd, even odd, et cetera, et cetera. So for each of these three events, check the outcomes and then enter the probability. So two or more even numbers were rolled. So here we have two, three is two or more, here's two. Here's two. So that's four out of the eight. All right, alternating even number and odd number with either coming first. Like here, odd, even, odd. Or here, even, odd, even. Okay. It's two out of eight. An even number on the second or the third roll or both. And by the way, the word or in math always means or both, unless specified otherwise. But they're just reinforcing um, here because this is a freshman level class too. <laughs> but in general, in math, or means one, the other, or both. So an even number on the second or third roll, or both, like here. And here, there's an even on the second and the third there. Second or the third. 
here it's on the second, here it's on the third. Okay, so that's six out of eight. And okay. So these are pretty straightforward. You're just checking off the outcomes that match the events and then counting which ones are checked, how many are checked off out of the total possible outcomes. All right, a tile is selected from seven tiles, each labeled with a different letter from the first seven letters of the alphabet. So let's write that. Uh, okay, I guess they're using capital. A, B, C, D. That's four, five, six, seven. Event X, the letter selected comes before E. So before E is A, B, C, and D. And Y, the letter is found in the word face. So I'm just gonna put them in alphabetical order. You don't have to, but I think it's easier to compare when we have everything in alphabetical order. So the event X or Y, this is like you would win if you had a letter that was in X or Y. So you want to include everything. Everything in both. A, B, C, D, E, F. Letters in X and Y have to be in both. So A is in both and C is in both. And then the complement of the event Y. So that's everything in S that is not in Y. So not Y, right? The complement means not. So you're going to include B, not C, D, not E, or F, and G. Okay. All right. Number 12. All right, so number 12 gets at this idea of the difference between independent and dependent events. Two events are independent if the occurrence of one event does not affect the probability of the other event occurring. Okay, they're completely separate one does not affect the probability of the other. Two events are called dependent if the occurrence of one event does affect the probability of the other. So for example here, consider choosing two objects randomly, one after the other from a group of objects. Let's say you replace the first object before making your second choice. So now the two events of the two draws are completely independent. Because suppose you had like 10 marbles, some black, some white. 
you draw one, probability of it being white is the number of white over the total. You put it back on your second draw, you have the same exact number of white and black marbles in the valve. So your first draw did not affect your second draw because you put it back. If, however, you don't replace the first object, now your next draw is dependent. First of all, you only have nine left. So the number on the bottom of your fraction, it's not 10 anymore, now it's nine. And suppose I took a white one. Well, now there are fewer white ones in the bag. So the probability depends on whether I drew a white one or a black one to begin. Okay. So what do you guys think? A coin is flipped, then a number cube with sides one through six is rolled. So basically a die. Um, the coin tosses heads and the number cube is a two. Are these dependent or independent events? Does the coin toss affect the dice rolling? Are they independent or dependent? you guys agree? Sunshine. Yep, they're completely independent events. The dice landing on the two had nothing to do with whether the coin was heads. All right, a paper clip is randomly selected from a container with green clips and white clips, and then it's returned. The paper clips are mixed, then another random selection is made. Are these two events independent or dependent? The first is a white, the second is a green. Sunshine, these are independent because you replaced the first paper clip. Okay. What do you guys think about the next three? Go ahead and put, you know, D or I for each one of those three while I bring my cat upstairs. All right, we've got one taker tonight. <laughs> and yep, dependent, independent, and dependent. Okay, so you're choosing chocolates. It's eaten, so it's not replaced. And then you make another choice. So that depends on what was chosen the first time. Right here, you're drawing marbles, but you put back. That's with replacement, so it's independent. Right, the first selection, you put it in the shopping cart, so it's not returned. So these are dependent. Okay. All right, a spinner has 10 equally sized sections, six are green, four blue. The spinner is spun, and at the same time, a fair coin is tossed. What is the probability that the spinner lands on blue and the coin toss is tails? And so it turns out that when you have two independent events, 
the probability of A and B is the probability of A times the probability of B. Okay, so if two events are independent, the probability of both is the product of their probabilities. So here, uh, you want the probability that the spinner lands on blue. So there are four out of the 10 times the probability that a coin toss is tails. So that's a half. So you get two tenths. Okay. We'll just pull up here. Right, we multiply the two probabilities, the probability of landing on blue times the probability of getting tails. Probability of landing on blue is four tenths or 0.4. Getting tails, it's a half or 0.5. Okay. And we're gonna see more later on why we multiply. Mm -hmm. Okay, when we have dependent events, on the other hand, like here, you have a box of 13 candies, four taffy, five caramel, four butterscotch, each candy is only in one of those categories. Rachel wants to select two. The first is at random. And then the second will be at random from the remaining ones. So these are dependent events. What's the probability that the two candies are taffy? So the probability for dependent events, you still multiply. You multiply the probability of A and then times the probability of B given that A happened, okay? So we read that as the probability of B given A and it's called conditional probability. So it's the probability of B and the condition is that A has occurred. And so originally you've got four taffy out of the 13 candies. Once you've selected one, you only have 12 left total and you only have three taffy left. So the probability of B given A is the three twelfths. And then you multiply. You can round to three decimal places. Okay. All right. An automobile manufacturing plant produced 37 vehicles today. 18 were trucks, nine were sedans, 10 were vans. So we're gonna select two for an inspection. The first is selected at random, and then the second will be selected at random from the remaining vehicles. So that means it's not with replacement, it's without replacement. What's the probability that the first is a sedan? So that would be nine out of the 37. And then the second is a van. So now you've got a total of 36. We chose a sedan, so there were eight of those left. We're talking about the number of vans. So that's 10 out of 36. And then we can multiply those and round. Nine out of 37.
times 10 over 36. And if you round to three decimal places, it'll be 0 0.068, right? You're gonna round up. Okay. So these are dependent events. All right, suppose now you have a die and you roll it twice. So an ordinary fair die with numbers one through six um, is rolled twice in su succession. The face values of the two rolls are added together. So you get a sum and that's the outcome of a single trial of a random experiment. And now we wanna find the probability that the sum of the two rolls is greater than nine and the sum is an even number. And so you wanna do a table Right, hopefully we're all kind of familiar with how these dice look with the numbers painted on there. So suppose they rolled a two first and then a four, it would look like that. And then you take the sum, so you get a sum of six. And these are the 36 possible outcomes here, or possible pairs. An outcome is the sum. So suppose you've got a one on your first roll you could have had a one on your second roll, a one on your first, a two on your second, a one on the first, a three on the second, a one on your first roll, a four on your second, et cetera. And then these are if you rolled a two on your first roll and then a one on your second, a two on your second, a three, et cetera. So altogether you get 36 total pairs. Each one of those pairs are equally likely so the probability of one of those pairs being rolled is one out of 36. Now you can look at the sums, like if you rolled a one and a one again, the sum is two. If you rolled a one and a two or a two and a one, the sum is three. So we notice along the diagonals, the sums are all the same. So there's a pattern that emerges. Okay, so the probability here that the sum is greater than nine, that means the sum is 10, 11, or 12. These are the three ways the sum could be 10. A four and a six, a five, a five, and a six and a four. And 11 and 12. So there are three ways, two ways, and one way. A total of six ways out of 36 or about 17%. Okay, the probability that the sum is an even number, so that means the sum is a two, a four, a six, an eight, a 10, or a 12. And again, you're just gonna look at the diagonals. A two, a four, a six, an eight, a 10, and a 12 and count the number of ways. There's one, there's three, there's one, two, three, four, five. There's one, two, three, four, five. There's one, two, three, and there's one. So there's nine and nine. There are 18 out of 36 ways to get an even sum or about 50%, 50% odd, 50% even, it turns out, okay? So again, don't try to do these in your head. You have to really write out the table, okay? Um, so we can see another one here. The sum is greater than six. The sum is not divisible by four and not divisible by, by six. So again, you wanna write out what all that means. Do the table, 
right? Greater than six means seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, or 12. So you're gonna look at these sums of seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12. Okay, not divisible by four means a four doesn't divide in evenly. Okay, so four is divisible by four. Eight is divisible by four. 12 is divisible by four. Not Numbers not divisible by six are six and 12. So these are the possible sums. And then you could count how many times it's possible to get those. And there you go. Okay. Okay, so here we have a standard deck of cards again. Suppose a card is drawn at random and then it's shuffled back in the deck. So this is with replacement. And then the second time a card is drawn, what's the probability that the first card is a face card and then the second one is a heart? Okay, so these are independent events. You can just do the probability of the first, which is 12 out of 52, times the probability of the second, which is 13 out of 52, or one-fourth, and then multiply them together. 12 out of 52 times 13 out of 52, or one-fourth. Okay, and these are asking to round to four decimal places. So pretty straightforward. Just so you know, some of these might ask you for three things, and we can extend this um, probability rule to three events. So let's see. Yeah. So here, a card is drawn at random, then it's put back in the deck. Then the second card is drawn at random and then put back in the deck. And then a third card is drawn. So what's the probability of first drawing a black card? That's a half. Then a face card. That's 12 thirteenths. And then times a red card, which is a half. Okay. So you're going to now just multiply all three of those together. A half times 12 over 52 times a half. Okay. Now for dependent events, you're not going to put the card back. You've got the standard 52 card deck. A card is drawn at random. The card is not put in the deck. Then a second card is drawn at random. Neither of the cards are put back in the deck. And then a third card is drawn. So what's the probability that all three of the cards are red? So on your first draw, you've got 26 out of 52. For your next draw, I really want to put, let me do it this way. Here's 26 cards out of a total of 52. Okay, once you've drawn a red card, you'll have 25 red cards left out of a total of 51. Then once you've drawn that one, you don't put it back. So there are 24 red cards left 
out of a total of 50 cards. Okay. And then you can multiply this on your calculator and round to four decimal places. In the interest of time, <laughs> they've already done it right here. Okay. Okay, a news organization survey, surveyed 75 adults. Each said he or she gets news from only one source. Here's a summary. Three of the adults are selected at random, one at a time, without replacement. Okay, so you choose a person, you ask them. You don't put them back. Now you're going to choose another person to ask them. What's the probability? that none of them get news from the internet. So none of them get news from the internet means they get news from one of these three sources. So that's 30, 43 out of the 75. So the probability that the first person does not is 43 out of the 75. Now, once you've taken that person, you've got 42 people left out of 74 people. And once that person has been chosen, there are 41 of these people left out of 73 total people. So same exact idea. Instead of cards, we're talking about people. Okay, multiply them all together around to three decimal places. All right, now these are with replacement. A fair die is rolled four times. What's the probability that a four is obtained on at least one of the four rolls? So sometimes it's easier to look at the complement, right? The probability that a four is obtained on at least one of the rolls that's one minus the probability that there was no four among any of the roles. So the number of ways, the probability that you didn't roll a four, there are five out of six other numbers. Right, so no four among the four roles is five, six to the fourth. And then you're gonna subtract that from one. Otherwise you would have to do the probability of you getting a four on just the first roll, plus the probability of getting a four on just the second, plus the probability of getting it on the third, et cetera, and then plus the probability of getting it on the first and the second, the first and the third, the first and the fourth, 
And then the probability of getting the first, second, third, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's way easier to say, well, what if, you know, we didn't roll a four at all? All right. An urn contains six green and seven red balls. Four are randomly drawn in succession with replacement. That is, after each draw, the selected ball is returned. What's the probability that all four draws, uh, all four balls are red? Okay, so, I mean, I kind of, we're going to, since you're replacing the balls, right? This is probability with replacement. They're independent events. You're just going to multiply the probability times the probability on the next one times the probability on the next one um, four times. So I kind of picture, you know, multiplying the four probabilities like this. So the first time, the probability of drawing a red ball, it's seven out of 13 total. Now you've replaced it. So in the second one, it's the same. Seven out of 13. You replace it. So it's the same. You replace it. So it's the same. And so again, you get seven to the 13, seven over 13 to the fourth power. So you want to make sure you put that in parentheses. And then raise it to the fourth power. And then round to three decimals, so 0 0.084. Sunshine. All right, now without replacement. A history class is comprised of six female and 10 male students. If the instructor randomly chooses 11 students, what is the probability that five female students and six male students will be selected? So now all 11 are being chosen at once from the total 16. This is called a combination. And so we want to find, and again, you know, it's kind of assumed that you guys have seen this before. It's taught in algebra. You've probably seen it elsewhere, just in K through 12 in high school. Um, but we are gonna go back and look more at the counting and combinations and how this all works. Sunshine, hold on. So you're choosing 11 from the 16. This is a combination. And we say 16 choose 11. Manually, there's a formula. You know, in general, we would say N choose R. And the formula is N factorial over n minus r factorial times um, r factorial. And we're gonna look at these factorials and whatnot as well. But for now, very handily, I might add, Alex has the built-in combination in here. So 16 choose 11. This is the number of ways you can choose 11 things from 16 things. And now specifically, you want to choose five females from the six females and six males from the 10 males. 
And so we want to get these two and multiply them together. And then we can get our total probability, right? So that's the number of ways of getting both of those 1,260 out of the total ways of just choosing the 11 out of the 16. Okay, so I'm going to jump down to um, the counting principle. And again, we've all seen this before, but um, it's really good to have this understood. And Alex does it, so they're using the same types of you know, problems and terminology and everything. So the Ross family is selecting a furniture set. Furniture set has a bed and a dresser. There are five beds and two dressers to choose from. How many different furniture sets could they select? Okay, so we could envision this tree diagram. There are five different beds. And for each bed, you could choose a different dresser. And so you could kind of go down, you know, a branch, bed one, dresser one, bed one, dresser two, bed two, dresser one, et cetera. And you end up with 10 different furniture sets. This is one of the actual approaches to multiplication, understanding this kind of like array. It's an array approach. Um, and we can use these tree diagrams. So like Deborah's ordering an ice cream dessert, there are two sizes, three flavors, and two toppings. So you could simply multiply those together to get the total number of different desserts. Two times three times two. This can help us visualize, look how big these trees start getting, right? And we're just using very small numbers. But sometimes, you know, it can be handy to just think in terms of like, what would I do? You know, each one of these is called a stage. So the first stage, you're choosing the size of the dessert. The next stage, you're choosing the flavor. And then the third stage, you're choosing the toppings. Hold on, hon. So there's something called the fundamental counting principle. Um, I guess that's explained on the next topic. Okay, hold on a second. Sorry. I'm sorry. The cat knows if he goes down there and yells, I'll, I'll go pick him up. He's so smart. All right, so Amy is studying the growth of a particular type of plant. She's testing the effects of four growth factors, lighting, age, temperature, humidity. What are the number of ways of combining one level from each of the growth factors. So again, we're just multiplying their five times six times five times three. Okay. Okay, and then we start talking about with and without rep repetition allowed. Suppose a company needs temporary passwords for the trial of a new payroll software. Each password will have two digits. So already I'm thinking, you know, two digits followed by two letters. 
the letters J, K, and L, and the digits three and six will not be used. So this is a digit, that's a digit, that's a letter, that's a letter. For the digits, three and six will not be used, and that's from zero to nine. There are 10 of them. So that means there are eight left. There are eight digits left. And then for the letters, there are 26 letters, but three are not used. So there are 23 left. Right, and you can multiply those together and you get the total number of possible passwords. And so here we have the fundamental counting principle. To find the number of ways a procedure can occur, we multiply the number of choices for each step in the procedure, right? You choose the first digit, you choose the second digit, you choose the first letter, you choose the second letter. Then you multiply them all together. Okay, so more formally, right, if there are C sub one choices for the first step, C sub two, et cetera, you just keep multiplying those number of ways for each step. Okay. And now suppose there's a specific arrangement, like 12 dancers are gonna line up on stage. Six are wearing black and six are red. A dancer wearing black must be in the first position and then they must alternate. In how many ways can the dancers line up? So you've got six choices to begin with for the black. These are the positions. Once you've chosen someone wearing black, you've got six choices for someone wearing red. And then there are five left wearing black, five left wearing red, four left wearing black, et cetera. So eventually you kind of see the pattern and you can just extend it and you multiply all those together. There are over a half a million ways you can line them up, which is pretty amazing, I think. And here we have 10 paintings hung. Three are Renaissance, seven are Baroque from left to right. All the Renaissance paintings will be hung first, followed by the Baroque. So first you have three choices of which, you know, to hang first. Right, Renaissance, 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 and then all of these are Baroque. You've got three choices. Once you choose one, there are two left, and then there's one left. Then you've got seven choices, then six choices, then five, then four, then three, then two, then one. So you multiply all these together. Okay. Three times two times one, et cetera. Okay, so we're going to stop here and pick back up at number 50 next time. So have a good night. Have a good weekend.